Good morning. Morning, morning, morning. This is exciting, yeah. So welcome to the new school. Welcome to the New York City Service Design Studio and Toolkit Launch Event. Isn't that awesome? Yeah? Yeah? Come on. This is amazing, right? Um, so first I would like to uh, thank the Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity, the City Community Development, the Mayor's Fund to Advance New York City for the invitation to open these proceedings. So my name is Eduardo Stasovsky. I'm the director of the Parsons Desert Lab and an associate professor of design strategies here at the New School. So a few remarks before we start this. So I want to talk about, you know, in a little bit of the academic work we do here in relation to this um, uh, event. So in my research and teaching, I have been very much engaged in defining pathways for design in the public sector, always looking for new perspectives, especially at the intersection between service design, policy making, and progressive social change. In other words, I see design as a collaborative social process that offers governments the opportunity to engage people around civic challenges in concert with policymakers and the public servants. In our work here at the DASIS Lab, we had the privilege to partner with a number of New York City agencies and their public servants, nonprofits, philanthropists, and the fellow New Yorkers to explore the potential of service design to better deliver public services and to encourage uh, and foster a more sustainable and equitable city. Thank you. A lot of you are here, and we, we had really uh, the pleasure to work and collaborate with you. Uh, we're extremely par uh, proud of being part of this community in this journey on experimenting, learning, and communicating the value of service design and government. But finding a place uh, for design and government can, can come in different forms. One way is to promote cultures of innovation from within by creating new infrastructures and norms to allow emerging forms of public innovation to flourish and exist in government. Places with the ability to experiment and try new things, where designers can experiment with policy, policymakers can experiment with service design, and public servants can co-design with city residents. Today we are here to celebrate an important breakthrough in building capacity for design inside governments as a central as central to delivering better, better government. The creation of the nation's first ever municipal service design studio. Yeah, right? And these guys have been, have been working around the clock and very hard. So today we also have a toolkit dedicated to making public services for New Yorkers as effective and accessible as possible. So given this mutual interest, and common goals, I very much look forward to hearing from the presenters and panelists this morning. And judging by the list of these civic innovation superstars that we have in the room and in the panel and the agenda of today's event, I really anticipate a very interesting intellectual and invigorating discussion. So I'd like to invite uh, Darren Block, the Executive Director of uh, Mayor's Fund to Advance New York City to the podium. Thank you so much and enjoy the event. Uh, thank you, Eduardo. Um, we really couldn't have a better partner in the work than Parsons and your team. The contributions to the project have been invaluable. Um, and let me join Eduardo in welcoming and thanking all of you for joining us in this inspiring and impactful project launch. Uh, let me also, before we get started, acknowledge a couple of our partners in government who are here. Commissioner Victor Khaleesi is here from Mayor's Office of People with Disabilities and Commissioner Salas. Um, Salas, excuse me, from, uh, from DCA, so thank you for joining us and for your interest in the, in the work. As executive director of the Mayor's Fund, it, it's a privilege to be able to see these types of partnerships develop and flourish. Um, these projects speak to the power of public-private partnership, and they represent the best of what we can achieve. So I want to just take a moment to just frame how this kind of work and how we see it sort of bringing together the entrepreneurial spirit of the private sector and the scale and reach of city government. Uh, for those unfamiliar with the Mayor's Fund, we're a 20-year-old nonprofit foundation um, that works with city agencies uh, and private sector civic investors uh, to help our city support New Yorkers and New York neighborhoods in new and efficient ways. Uh, so an effort like service design, it's a tool to, uh, to better engage citizens and clients to improve the delivery of outcomes for citizens and clients. It really goes to the heart uh, of the work we like to see advanced. And to get us to this point, um, and to give us this great start, it really are partners like uh, Citibank and Cities Community Development Team that enable this. Um, 
A point the mayor likes to make frequently is that the challenges our city faces can't be overcome by government alone. Um, and we're thrilled to have partners like Bob and Eileen uh, who understand uh, the goals we're trying to achieve and to help contribute to innovation and innovative, innovative solutions. Um, one note I'll make is this is actually the second or the third big announcement I've been able to attend with Bob and Eileen. Um, so they're probably tired of me thanking them, but I will say that, that for you guys, if you're, uh, if you're able to keep doing this, I'm able to keep coming and thanking you. So thank you for your, for your investments. I appreciate it. Please. Uh, this is a project that, that no doubt will affect millions of New Yorkers using city services on a daily basis. Um, but we also know that the work kicks off a new era of program and policy design. Uh, it's one that's going to leave its mark not only here in New York City, but also as we serve as a model for municipalities and regions looking to, to bring kind of a new phase of civic design into the work of delivering services. So with that said, please join me in welcoming uh, Bob Anabali, who's the Global Director of Inclusion uh, finance community development for city. Thank you. Wow, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, thanks. On behalf of everybody at City First, let me thank Parsons in this fabulous hall, which is the second time I've had a chance to come to and, and to speak at, um, but more to learn, learn in, as, as, as many of you will and, and share. Um, we are so excited about this project and this work that first let me thank all of you as partners, because it's, it's taking many, in terms of both the commissioners who are here, in terms of Darren and the Mayor's Fund, and many others who have taught us a great deal about why this is such a compelling program. First, I'd like to also say the launch of this service design toolkit is going to be a great benefit, not just for New York, but we believe for many other cities in the US. And the work here in New York is something that will be replicated. But I came two years ago here when there was a conference, and it was an international conference, and we, Marshall Sitton, who is my colleague you'll get to hear later, um, asked us about sponsoring this conference on service design. And I have to tell you, none of us knew what he was talking about. And then he said at Parsons on service design, and I kept thinking, is it about you know, infographics or the logo? branding. I mean, I couldn't quite make the connection. Um, Eileen Ald, who you'll, you'll also get to meet, and I and, and my other colleagues spent some time with Marshall, and it really was the explanation of this compelling methodology um, and way of approaching an issue and, and a user that was so different from the work that we had been doing for so long. Many of us who were not experts in any of this area we're sort of trapped in the past a view of re-engineering. Re-engineering is the term we always used for improving a process. Basically, and it was done by engineers. It was done by the operations people, the process people, and usually meant cutting out steps, um, making it more cost efficient. And it, very rarely did it really focus and begin its focus on the user. We might have said the end user. And, Service design, we realize it's not the end user, it's the beginning of the process. It's the beginning of the design and the journey. So together with Parsons and, and the city, and we'll talk more about who they are, um, we began this journey of awareness first. And you will hear from Matt Klein, who I think you're going to all be thrilled with, who also heads the Mayor's Office of Economic Opportunity, and has this concept and plan, thought of a lab that could work across city agencies and delivering, really improving the delivery of services and design of the outcome of services. It, it excited us a lot, and many of us have been on this journey just for a short time, so forgive us. Um, I normally lead city's commitment and our work around inclusive finance and community development. Inclusive finance being how do we serve all, mostly those who are underserved or unserved in many parts of the world in terms of financial services. And maybe we too have been slowly learning, as you do in service design, that to achieve that did not mean for people who today, in the example I give, who are unbanked in many countries, want to repeat my childhood experience of becoming engaged in financial services. They're not going to perhaps be taken by their parents to the local community bank to get their first savings account. 
and then have the evolution of a checking account, and then one day a credit card. People are skipping all those legacy processes. And when I'm in Mexico, we've been opening six million accounts that are completely done from people who already have a mobile relationship with their mobile operator, who use a retailer that's bigger than any bank in terms of outlets and branches, whose idea is, I need this solution. I don't know that I need it to be banked only. I need it, as I become aware, multiple tools. I need access to my funds. I need a safe place to keep money. I want to transfer it quickly. And I don't have the time, even if you wanted me to come, which banks don't generally, to come into your branches all the time. And so what we found in much of the world is people have leapfrogged whole processes and left us, people like me, you know, who my nephew always tease here in New York, who has, still has landlines in his house and, you know, still has a fax somewhere. And, you know, and they just don't understand why are you doing this? Why do you get paper statements for anything? You know, they leap, people are leapfrogging. And I think in many ways, as I think of the work that you're doing in service design, the equivalent around the world and here is how do we create that experience for people that gets them closer and more easily to the solution that they're serving, they're seeking, and allow those in public sector to serve people well with the least friction and most efficiently and at the essence of what both they're looking for and need. In financial services, and we've worked with uh, OFE, the Office of Financial Empowerment and the Commissioner of Consumer Affairs, we think very much about that. We started in many ways looking at things such as the earned income tax credits. How do people get free tax preparation? Um, and lower income households that are working have this opportunity to get up to $5,000 of credit back. And it's an earned process. It's not a benefit. It's no different than any of your tax benefits. <clears throat> but the turnout, people were using and paying for services that were often led to what many may even think of as predatory lending, because now you know they're getting a refund, low income households to work with the city on how do we double the number of people that are availing of these services. In working with your, the, comm the commissioner, again, on immigrant affairs in New York, on citizenship, how do we help more New Yorkers who are eligible to, to finish that journey, to accelerate that journey? What was holding it back? Why did people, when they got their green card, their residency, not go the last mile, when we knew how important that was for their children, particularly, that they have that right and that choice that citizenship conveys in terms of scholarships, jobs, mobility. And we knew it wasn't because, in some cases, we didn't have a department or an agency or even the right regulation that's favorable or legislation, but the connection between that, the fact that I would call it EITC, Earned Income Tax Credit. You know, it's sort of, I always tease, I live in London, so I'm always joking here in America, and when we talk about Children's savings, nobody calls it children's savings. They say, do you have a, um, what is it, a 529? And if you talk about a retirement, they say, do you have a 401k? So anyone from abroad says, what, are you, what does that mean? I said, they're talking in tax code. They're literally referencing an IRS tax code when what you really meant to say is the ability to save from a child from kindergarten to college, as we call a program we do in San Francisco, which is a universal child savings program. And a very interesting program being tested here for New York. So we question, and, and the work I think that all of you are doing is to help us think about the journey and the design of what it is that we're trying to achieve and who we hope to serve. And particularly in our case, we're looking here in New York at particularly low income and vulnerable communities. And people living in the most complex environments but often we are leaving them with processes that are legacy processes for most of us. Um, and it's of no fault of those delivering it, but they really need tools. And so it was enormously helpful for us working with Matt Klein and the commissioners and many here at Parsons, but I'll talk specifically about the program that we are gonna hear more of today, the DESIS, DESIS, you're gonna say DESIS, right? Lab. Um, that you are already thinking how to approach this. And that what we really needed to do is to build out the capacity of those who could bring together those resources and the services that will really help people to overcome these challenges and, and deliver real, efficient, tangible value. 
um, without the unintended negative consequences that re-engineering has often accounted for. Because that began with the process as it sits today and didn't begin with the client or the beneficiary or the citizen. Um, it doesn't happen on its own. Good intentions aren't enough. So the idea as to how to build this out and provide design services with people as opposed to at people and for them. And usually end up falling in the past pretty short, short of our goal. We believe this is an undertaking that's going to take us there. So in 2014, we brought together, we were brought together too with the Mayor's Office of Economic Opportunity, New York City Department of Consumer Affairs and Financial Empowerment, and the Mayor's Fund and Parsons Desis Lab to launch designing financial firm financial empowerment. We want to explore that methodology and hope that you'll hear give us ideas today how to do more. But more importantly, we believe that it's important to fund and support this creation of a lab. So it's with that that we are very excited to be able to provide that key initial support of $500,000 towards the development and building out of that lab, which we believe will just be the beginning of a journey that Matt will talk to after this. And we'll begin going beyond the process of re-engineering and one of really designing for people and designing for outcomes. So once again, on behalf of the city, congratulations to the mayor, Matt Klein, Ariel Cannon, who's working together with Matt, the Mayor's Office of Economic Opportunity, on, the, on this launch of this new service lab. And we hope that so many of you will be involved in this and that New York will share its experience with mayor's offices and, and commissioners around the country. Thank you on behalf of the city. Thank you so much, Bob. I'm Matt Klein. Uh, on behalf of the Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity, on behalf of Mayor de Blasio, thank you so much for joining us. I want to also echo some of the thanks that have been given here already. Um, thanks first to Eduardo, not only for hosting us, obviously, in this beautiful space, but for all of your work over the years uh, to inspire the use of service design uh, principles in government um, for seeding uh, what, is, what is coming to fruition today. Um, thank you also um, to Darren and the Mayor's Fund uh, in your work and leadership and bringing together um, partnerships across the city on so many different things. Um, but also, you know, thank you so much to you, Bob, to City Community Development, uh, your leadership, your willingness to take risks, um, uh, to invest in things that, you, that you, as you describe, you're new to. Um, that's made a difference for, for millions of people around the world, um, as you've described, uh, uh, for financial inclusion, uh, for poverty here in the city. Um, and, and we're not supposed to say favorites uh, when it comes to funders, uh, but your team here in New York, uh, led by Eileen Ald, um, I can say at least she's one of our favorites. Uh, um, uh, and so smart uh, in terms of thinking about how to leverage private dollars to catalyze uh, systems change. Um, and so we hope we're doing that uh, here today. Um, and finally, I want to just thank the community that's here in the room with us, the students, uh, the government colleagues, uh, the designers, the design communities, the government innovation junkies who turn out for things like this. Uh, you all are our people, um, and it's because of the work that you do and that uh, inspires us uh, to try and carry forward the principles that's represented in what you do every day. And so we thank you so much uh, for being here for, for what for us is very exciting. The work of the Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity is driven basically by a simple idea that where you start out in life should not dictate where you end up. Uh, and that means that the American ideal of equal opportunity has to be made more genuine, more real for all New Yorkers. Um, and so our work in our office aims uh, to bring us closer to uh, that ideal. And what does that mean in practice? It means things like research to better understand the nuances of poverty and how different policies affect the poverty rate in New York City. It means building evidence about what works. Uh, so we work with our agency colleagues to test new anti-poverty models, uh, to evaluate them rigorously, to also bring evaluation tools to broader uh, mayoral initiatives like pre-K for all. It means using data and technology in new ways. Uh, so that we can build digital products uh, that can benefit low-income New Yorkers and integrate data from across city agencies uh, so that we're delivering more holistic services. 
And in all that work, the principles and practices of service design are present. Um, they've been there over the 10-year history of our office, um, but we've uh, recognize the need to be more explicit, to be more professional, to bring the, uh, the, the particulars of the methodologies into our work more explicitly. And folks have talked a little bit about the benefits of service design, but let me just flag two. First, uh, when applied well, service design allows us uh, to make dignity a greater part of the service experience for New Yorkers. It means we can better understand the experiences of folks who engage with the city. Not just how we intend them to engage with us, but how they actually do. Not just what we hope the results are gonna be, but what they really turn out to be on the ground in the day-to-day -day experiences. And that can be particularly useful when confronting issues of poverty and inequality when folks' voices, as we all, as we all know, uh, can so often be overlooked. And second, these methods of service design aren't just about process. It's not just about sticky notes and having interesting meetings. Um, it's about results. It's about garnering the insights from, as I said, how things actually work uh, to make them better, uh, to improve constantly. And that's a challenge that in government we continually face. And so we're excited that the service design studio can serve as a new resource for us in city government. It's something that's not just uh, to enhance the way the Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity does our individual work. Because there's practice and pockets of design and design services that exist across the city right now, whether it's in the Department of Education or the Department of City Planning or um, our department uh, that manages technology. I'm looking around the room and seeing folks who are practicing every day design within government. So we're hopeful that this service design studio can accelerate and amplify that work, lift it up, bring it, um, um, bring it um, even more prominently uh, to the practice of the way that uh, our agencies do our work. And we know that um, where New York City leads, other cities will follow. So we're, we share uh, city community development's vision that service design uh, will begin to be embedded in the ways that city governments do its work nationally. So I'm, I'm excited about today. And now it, it really gives me great pleasure um, uh, in a minute to introduce Ariel Kennan to uh, talk more about the details of the service design studio. And Arielle is a force. Uh, many of you know her already, um, either personally, by reputation, you know about her work. Um, she uh, has been a driving visionary for the work of service design uh, nationally here in the city. I am, uh, feel very lucky uh, to be able to have her as a colleague, and I think um, as, as a city, we're lucky to have her as an asset for us. So let me welcome uh, to stage uh, Arielle Cannon, our Director of Design and Product, who oversees our service design studio. So thank you. Thank you very much. So, Arielle. Thank you so much for that, Matt. Um, it's an honor to work alongside you every day. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, good morning to everyone in this room. Um, it's wonderful to have this auditorium of design fans and friends with us. I also want to give a shout out to everyone who's listening online um, from near and far. Um, thank you for tuning in today as well. So my story uh, started as wanting to go to school here in New York and study design. As a Parsons student, I honed my craft. And I also did a few civic-minded projects, not knowing exactly where my future was gonna lead. As a graduate, I went on into the design consulting field. I created things like new public spaces, retail stores, museums, and I also fell even more in love with cities. That love took me to Code for America, uh, where I got to work in government firsthand and also see the opportunity for the impact of design in the public sector. After I wrapped up my year in Kansas City, I knew that I wanted to come home and serve the city that taught me how to be a designer and also join an administration committed to equity. I was lucky to land in what is now the Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity. Matt gave a great summation of the work that we do every day. Um, I think of these often as our superpowers coming together um, to tackle hard challenges around poverty and really focus on increasing equity and opportunity for low-income New Yorkers. We have such a vital role as government as being able to improve the lives of our residents. 
So our work over the last couple years has been hiring designers, and we've started to work with city agencies, nonprofit providers, um, and residents directly to improve service delivery. We've tackled things like benefits access, um, working on Access NYC and Growing Up NYC, two of our digital products. We've helped bring Wi-Fi to the Queensbridge houses, and we also help document enhanced street homeless services in the Mayor's Homestat Initiative. We have, in addition to this work, um, engaged outside designers on some of our projects, and also in the Designing for Financial Empowerment projects. All of this together has been an incredible groundswell of support and commitment to increasing design inside New York City government. We've started calling our practice civic service design. That is practicing service design inside government. Service design for the uninitiated um, is a participatory process. It considers all aspects of the service and the people who use and deliver it and engages them in creating and forming the service itself. The solutions can take on many forms. They can be ways of working, they can be new processes, communications, digital products, um, and even the built environment. So, Today, I am proud to announce the Mayor's Office of Economic Opportunity Service Design Studio. We are the first municipal service design studio committed to making services for low-income residents as effective and accessible as possible. We're in Thank you. Thank you. We're here as an internal resource. We're here to help the city further engage the residents and those who deliver our services and bring their insights into the process of making them even better. Our team is versed in design tools, has deep experience in creating in-person services and digital products, and also is committed to addressing poverty-related challenges. Um, so today, I'm going to share some of the building blocks of our design culture. We've been really thinking about the work that we do, but also the mission and the principles, the tools that we use, the tactics that are behind them, and also the goals that we're setting to lead us in our work and our design practice itself. So first is our mission. We, as public servants and designers, have a shared mission in delivering services. We are helping make public services more effective and accessible for New Yorkers. We also have principles that underlay all of our work. So we believe government services should be created with the people who use and deliver them. We have to go out and talk to the people who not only deliver them, but the people who are receiving those services to help us understand their motivations, the challenges they face, and bring those back into the decisions that we make in establishing programs, policies, products, et cetera. They must also be prototyped and tested for usability. We need to try out things in low risk ways so that we can mitigate that risk and help make more resilient ideas in the end. We also make, must make services accessible for all. We need to make sure that we can lower the barriers and people can get the services that they're entitled to. We also must make sure that they're equitably distributed. We must make sure that they are fairly uh, distributed so people get them where and uh, uh, with the skills that they have. Um, we must also make sure that our services are rigorously tested and evaluated for effectiveness and impact. Together, these principles are guiding our work every single day, and we're also wanting to share them to help inspire you and in creating your services. Uh, so now I would love to invite uh, Mari Nakano, who's our Deputy Design Director, and Tim Reitzis, um, is a designer at our Mayor's Service Design Studio. Thank you. Thanks, Ariel. So I'm Tim Reitzis. I'm a designer at our service design studio. So as Ariel mentioned, we've developed uh, and established a set of tactics to make sure that uh, our work reflects those principles that she just talked about. And we use these tactics on each project that we work on, whether it's digital, paper, or in-person service. But we don't always use these tactics in the same way are in the same order. 
They're not really prescriptive like that. Uh, we mix and match to use what we need to get the job done. So in order to build a new service or improve on an existing service, we work to understand the landscape. Who's doing something similar, whether it's inside of government or outside of government? What's been working and what maybe hasn't worked so well? What barriers have they had to overcome? What do we already know about the people who will be receiving and delivering the service? And what evidence and data is out there to help inform and support our work? Setting the stage really helps us put a service in context so that we can take a deeper dive. Now, this is probably our most important tactic. Getting out and talking to the people who will be receiving, delivering, and governing a service helps us see firsthand what's working and where the service might be falling short. More importantly, it also helps us learn what drives these people, their fears, their apprehensions, their aspirations. And we do this in a number of ways, from observing service delivery in the field, sometimes on a 100 degree day in the middle of August, to talking with stakeholders one-on-one. -on -one. And we encourage everyone on our project teams to take part in this, because talking with people helps us to set aside our assumptions and to understand and see a service through the lens of the people who interact with it every day. Now, observing complex services generates a lot of great data and information. So this tactic is all about, for us, how we make sense of and synthesize that, what we've heard, seen, and learned from our research. So we might start by getting our team together and doing a brain dump of all of our findings from user interviews onto sticky notes that we can arrange and rearrange to start seeing patterns and themes emerge. And then map out the entire journey of the service, iterating on that with input from our stakeholders until we get to something that we can share with a wider audience. Connecting the dots helps us tell the story of a service and helps us to clearly see where we can focus to make the biggest positive impact. Now, turning our insights into solutions can often be a little messy. Uh, so we use focused activities to help us generate ideas for service solutions that are both innovative and feasible to implement. We want to dream big, but also stay grounded in what we can actually deliver. And we take those ideas and we test them early and often with real users and stakeholders, iterating on them until we get to what works. And this process of prototype, test, and iterate works with in-person services, digital products, branding, really works across the board. Uh, because at its core, trying things out for us is about not holding on too tight to that first good idea. We learn quickly and inexpensively what's working, what's not working as well, so that we can move forward with confidence. But we know that doing design isn't enough. As Ariel and Matt have mentioned, impact is kind of where it's at. We need to know that our work is having real positive impact on the lives of New Yorkers. So we're measuring that quantitatively and qualitatively, whether that's how many New Yorkers have been able to successfully complete benefits screening eligibility on Access NYC, or how many homeless New Yorkers were able to move into housing after our work on Homestat. Focusing on impact makes sure that we're not doing design for the sake of doing design. And that we're focused on delivering accessible and effective public services for the city of New York. Now for some of you, these tactics might feel very familiar. You might be using them in your work today. And for others, they may represent a new and different approach. But we work to make sure that they would be useful for everyone in this room, whether you're working inside of government 
or outside of government, on a digital product or an in-person service. Uh, most importantly, whether you're a designer or maybe just design curious. We hope that these tactics can be useful for you in your work. Hi everyone, my name is Mari Nakano and I'm the Deputy Director of the awesome Service Design Studio. Um, Tim's given you a great overview of the tactics that we've established and explained how we work. And I wanna go into a bit of like what we're doing to, to support you. Okay. The Service Design Studio lets us work with you in a number of ways from light coaching to training to deep collaboration. We're designing a studio that lets us enter a relationship with you at the inception of an idea, when you're in the middle of trying to make something happen, or when you're ready to deploy and set your idea out into the world. We're here to support at any stage of your process, and we're here to support the whole process from start to finish too. Uh, starting next week, we'll be hosting one-on-one -on -one office hours at our studio in Brooklyn, where we can sit down and talk about how service design might help support your work. Within the next few months, we'll also be offering workshops and trainings open to city employees. We'll also be taking on a few bigger projects from end to end. Um, actually, next January, we'll be doing an open call for project proposals. This is something really exciting for us and to be a designer embedded and who gets the opportunity to work deeply with our city is a real privilege. Um, Ariel will give you more details a little bit later about all the things that I've just mentioned. But what we really want you to know is that we're here and we're really excited to work as your partner and to find the best ways for you to accomplish your agency's vision. So we're a small team in a big city of 8.5 million residents with around 30,000 public servants and over 70 offices. Um, well, we can't directly support every team in the cities that's interested in bringing service design to their work. We have come up with ways and are developing new ways to scale what we do. That is why we created the Civic Service Design Toolkit so that you and your team can start applying some of the things that we've discussed right away. The toolkit, which I'll show you in a second, is meant to be used by public servants, so the content within it is focused on them. Um, so when we're creating the toolkit, we used our very own service design tactics and principles to help develop what you'll see today. We ran stakeholder interviews with folks inside NYC government, as well as folks from other cities, states, and federal agencies. We spoke to them to find out where they needed additional support and shaped a lot of the activities around those needs. We talked to other civil um, service design practitioners to understand how they were effectively serving their clients. And we also tested the toolkit components with city employees to see if the content resonated. The toolkit takes on three forms, a website, binder, and small book. This is a quick animation of what the website looks like. You can go to um, nyc.gov slash service design and check it out. There's explanations on our tactics and links to downloadable templates, case studies, and some fun designs you can print and post at your offices. The physical version, the binder, which you see here, uh, provides you with starter design supplies like sticky notes, stickers, and colored pens. Um, it carries all the templates and some case studies. It's great because you can add or remove components, use it to archive some of your work, and customize and evolve your approach. We have some sample binders actually outside in the lobby, so afterwards if you wanna go check it out, feel free. Um, and for all of those who will be coming to our office hours, we'll be giving them out there as well. Um, last but not least is this kind of feel size guidebook. Where did it go? I had, someone stole it. It's so cool. Uh, <laughs> but you know, I actually carry that thing around a lot. Um, it's in my bag all the time. It's really easy to read on my train commute home. It's a really great companion to have at your desk or you know, carry in your bag as 
as a user of it, I found it really great for just reminding me from time to time about what else I need to think about when I'm doing my work. Um, we'll definitely uh, continue to grow the toolkit based on emerging and changing tool needs. It's not a finished product, it's, it's an iteration. Um, actually, the book that you guys have is version two. Um, we created these materials in the context of NYC government, but these tools are highly adaptable to any organization. Please use them to seek permission to work in new ways. Ask us questions about it. Share back what's working, what's not, what else you'd like to have in your arsenal. We're here to continuously improve what we make for the city so our city can continue to improve the services it provides for our people. So, uh, you know, we know that not everyone is going to have the bandwidth to design in-house. And so for those cases, the mayor's office and the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunication, do it, are partnering on a new master contract to make it easier for city agencies to purchase design services. The government by design contract will include digital communication and service design. And our service design studio will be part of the committee selecting top-notch design firms and providing ongoing support to agencies utilizing the master contract. I'm gonna hand it off to Ariel now who's gonna share with you more in detail about the ways that you guys can get involved. Thanks so much. Thanks, Mari and Tim. All right, everybody, we gave you a lot of information and a lot of things that you're probably excited about and wanna learn more about. So we wanna make it really easy for you to engage as well. So first and foremost, nyc.gov slash service design, that is the place to go for everything. That is the toolkit, that's how you get in touch with us, um, that's how you can find all of the links as well. Um, as we said, we really want you to start using the toolkit. We also really want your feedback, and we also really want you to share it with your colleagues, um, with people you know and work in other organizations and other agencies, um, and please come back and tell us all about it. Mari mentioned we're going to start doing office hours. Um, these are for our government friends near and far. We would like to go on our first date with you. Please visit us um, at this URL. Um, we'll be having office hours on Tuesdays and Thursdays um, to start. Please sign up and book a time with us. We'll also be doing an open call for projects from our New York City government agencies. You will get to work with us over six to 12 months getting full service design services. Um, we'll be doing this um, as an open project call where we are asking for your proposals about where you see service design fitting into your agency and on really hard poverty related challenges that you're working on. We are also, for our New York City government friends, hosting the New York City Civic Service Design Forum on November 30th. It'll be in the morning for just a few hours. Um, this is with our friends also at Do It. Um, we'll be sharing news on this launch, news on the tools, the master contract, um, and also having a special guest speaker. Um, we will be doing these on an ongoing basis, um, so I encourage you to sign up um, and start joining us. For all of our design students that are out there, we host a wonderful design apprenticeship program which allows students to work alongside us on real projects. Um, we've had a great group of apprentices who have been working us, with us over the past year to put together all of the materials and strategy that you see for the studio, um, as well as working on our projects directly. Um, we just opened our call for apprenticeship applications for, the, uh, for winter 2017, um, so visit this URL um, and send us a note with your portfolio to apply. And we have a brand new um, opportunity to uh, volunteer with the city. So this is a call for all designers out there. Um, we've been recently asked um, to start having pro bono designers um, to work with us on an ongoing basis at the studio. Our first challenge that we're gonna work on is working with the Office of Emergency and Management, assisting Hurricane Maria evacuees. Um, it's a really um, incredible project. I know that we're all really feeling for the people of Puerto Rico um, and wanna help them out. So check out this URL um, and sign up to volunteer. Um, so those are all the ways um, to get involved. As I said, nyc.gov slash service design, that is the place to go for any and all information and also how to get in touch with us. 
So I want to talk a little bit more about vision and goals. But to do that, I would like to invite Eileen Ald, the New York, and New York and Tri-State Director for City Community Development and our trusted partner in bringing this initiative to life to join me. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you. you. Did very well. As a former New York City public servant and the director of community development for City, I understand the needs of low-income individuals and families in the City of New York, and I am deeply hopeful of the potential of service design. 44.2% of New Yorkers live below or near the poverty line. We are implementing service design initiatives to help change the lives of New Yorkers, impacting their families to help lift them out of poverty. We are also empowering public servants with tools to start using design. We're setting goals around the number of projects influ influenced by design methods, the number of staff trained in design, and also the number of staff designers. City Community Development and the City of New York envision the service design approach to spread across municipalities and nonprofits to improve services for low income residents. City Community Development has shared our service design projects in partnership with the City of New York with nonprofit municipal leaders from Miami, Washington, D.C., San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Oakland. And the New York Service Design Studio has already shared and learned from Seattle, Austin, Boston, San Francisco, and Oakland. So we hope today has inspired you in your work to continue making services more effective and accessible for all of our New York City residents. We really look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. So now I would love to invite up our panelists and our moderator um, to show us some service design in action. Welcome, folks. Um, uh, and uh, let me just kick us off. I think the easiest way to do this is just ask each of you uh, to share your name, title, and what's your connection to service design? Sure. So hi, everyone. My name is Lara Penning. I'm an associate professor of transdisciplinary design here at Parsons at the New School. I'm the director of the transdisciplinary design graduate program. I'm also a co-founder of uh, uh, Parsons Thesis Lab. And I'm a long time I'm a service design professor and a long time evangelist with my service design BFF on my right. Morning. Um, my name is Marshall Sitton, um, Vice President of Communications Policy and Research uh, for City Community Development. Um, I also, I'm a, along with uh, Lara, I'm a co-founder of the local uh, New York City service design community, and I teach a service design a graduate course at the School of Visual Arts. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> some of my students are here. Uh, they're, they're, you know, they're pass fail, so it's weird that they're cheering. <laughs> but, Good morning, everyone. My name is Jess Brooks. I'm the Assistant Director of Financial Counseling and Coaching Programs at the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs Office of Financial Empowerment. Um, so I came into this whole world be, with, through the Designing for Financial Empowerment project, the third iteration of it around financial counseling. Morning, everybody. My name is Michael Hickey. I'm the Director of Strategy and Partnerships for the Office of Community Schools in the Department of Education. Um, I'm an accidental entrant into the world of service design. Um, I work on a team that has a big commitment to adaptive change, and this is one of the strategies that we've um, luckily fallen into. Good morning. My name is Tina Chu. I'm the Deputy Director of, uh, for Performance Management at the Mayor's Office of Operations. I'm a beneficiary of service design uh, through my work as part of the team at Operations that um, works on the Homestat project. So let's come the other way now, start with you, Tina, and just uh, kick us off a little bit about how service design has played out inside government from your vantage. Um, so just a little bit of context about Homestat, if people are not familiar with, with that particular initiative. Um, it's the most comprehensive street homeless outreach effort in a major American city, and it partners with existing street homeless outreach programs and prevention programs, but also tries to provide innovations so that we can better identify 
engage and transition people who are street homeless from into services and also obviously into sort of permanent and stable housing. Um, so uh, the mayor announced this initiative in December 2015 um, with the idea of launching, uh, the commitment of launching in April of 20, what, my, what year am I in? In April 2016. Um, so that did not give us a whole lot of time to put a project and program together. And as I said before, this is uh, partnering with existing programs. So we are actually working with um, the Department of Homeless Services and their street outreach programs, uh, along with their five contracted outreach providers. And I need to name them because they're very important. Um, BRC, Project Hospitality in Staten Island, Bronx Works, um, uh, various providers in the Manhattan Outreach Consortium, and Breaking Ground. Um, so one of the things that was really key and important about this particular initiative to get it up and running is one, obviously, to understand what's actually going on currently. If you're going to make improvements, you can't do that well if you don't actually understand the current state of affairs. And I said I was a beneficiary and, my, and other folks in operations were clearly very lucky by the fact that Matt and Ariel are on the floor all the time. So you were in the rooms when the project was getting launched and it was clear that the design perspective was going to be really critical and helpful. So while some of us were working on putting other aspects of the program together, a huge amount of effort was done and to create the stakeholder insight report that you see here, which every person on our team has and which we've also given to um, copious other people and other agencies and the providers as well. Um, Ariel and her team wound up interviewing about 40 people, uh, 40 government staff, around 30 uh, provider staff, and I believe around 10 actual uh, individuals who are street homeless clients themselves. And through this process really developed a, a journey map to really understand what does it take to help an individual from the moment that they're identified on the streets, unsheltered, in need of assistance, to actually get them into permanent housing. And I think one of the slides back here will, or you may have seen before, um, sort of shows the journey map and people when they see it originally like, ooh, fancy colors, dots, <laughs> ooh. Um, but what it really reflects is just the huge amount of effort and handoffs, you know, the baton switching from one person to another to try to help an individual. And you see really clearly and quickly how many like detours, dead ends, um, all kinds of obstacles that could crop up because we don't have a good streamlined way of assisting people. So with the journey map and with the stakeholder insight report, it was very clear to us sort of what was at stake, um, what we would need to be thinking about. There are enhancements and recommendations that helped us think about next steps. Um, they're also very key to this effort was um, all of the interviews with the providers helped us really understand the pain points that they felt. And one of the things that became sort of very immediate was that all of this information that we have to gather here is something that providers are doing, were doing on their own as well. But they were working with the city um, using a legacy system and having a lot of problems with it. And hearing from us that we, the city wants to come in and help you and, put data together better, blah, blah, blah. I was like, oh, great. We think, we think we've heard this spiel before, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but under, really understanding what they said about, like, I think there's a quote in the back of, back of this, um, the report where it says, it's a nightmare using the current system. <laughs> um, that was a good tip off to us that we need to understand how to move away from the nightmare and we don't want to create, like, another system that's just frustration 2.0 for them. So part of the design work and service design learning, uh, I have to give credit to two people on our team, um, Nathan Story and Sam Glazer Nolan, who by learning from the process that, um, of, of civic service design, were able to really think about how do we work with providers, really understand what their issues are, if we're kind of trying to create a new system for them, which is actually up and running now called Street Smart. Um, and the capability of putting that together relied a lot on talking with individuals, not just you know on the phone, but like really going on site to them, going out to Staten Island, going to the Bronx, being on site, 
talking with people directly, but then overhearing what people are saying and using that information to inform them as to like, okay, we thought the issue was this, we thought our solution was this, but actually the person right behind us who we didn't even invite to this meeting says, wait a minute, that's, not, that's really not gonna work, that's not gonna help. Um, and listening to that, taking that, and incorporating that into the work going forward got us to a really good product much more quickly with the help of the Department of Social Services um, Office of Informatics and Information Technology this sort of like design and feedback loop, incorporating um, what we heard from the providers and really building a system for them, for them, so that it works for individuals on the street, so that it works for us as the city. Thank you, Tina. Mike, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna take a little risk here. Um, my, my mom uh, recently started following me on Instagram and I'm trying to give her behavioral nudges. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm just wondering if everybody would just say hi to my mom really quick um, as a way to demonstrate that we're all committed to design-based interventions. Um, so, on three, everybody say hi, Janet. Ready? One, two, three. Hi, Janet. Oh, she's going to love that. Okay. All silliness aside, um, you know, in the Community Schools Initiative, Community Schools is really an initiative that is, has been built to support, in many cases, many of the most struggling schools in the city. There are schools that are really located, uh, concentrated in, in low-income parts of New York City um, and serving our most vulnerable students and families. That's not surprising that many of the interventions that we're trying to create are there uh, to mitigate against the harmful impacts of poverty. Um, very early on, we actually invited HRA out to come and talk to a big planning and training convening that we had with all of our members there. We had, at that time, 150 community school partners. And we literally just put all of HRA's services up on an instant polling platform. And we said, we don't have time to talk about everything because it's a big audience. Um, can you just tell us which ones are the most important? And everybody whipped out their smartphone. We did this quick instant poll. It was really cool. And um, uh, the things that came up were hunger, homelessness, lack of access to health care, and the need for immigration legal service supports. Um, so based on that kind of very immediate feedback, we started looking into this question of, what are the challenges that families are facing in terms of uh, trying to navigate these systems? So what Tina said, you know, it's a very fragmented, challenging system to navigate your way to accessing public benefits. We knew we needed a better strategy. Um, I, for some time, had been wanting to do work with uh, Public Policy Lab, uh, Chelsea Malton, I think, is probably here in the audience. Um, and I knew about this really incredible organization, Single Stop, and Sophia Heller was here as well earlier. Um, and uh, I think as we started to talk to our schools, we realized that they had never really heard or integrated with Single Stop. Um, so Single Stop is a, a, a decentralized network of nonprofit organizations organized by a single entity. And when you walk into a single stop office, you can apply for your SNAP benefits, for child health care, for um, your uh, en enrollment and workforce development supports. You can get legal services all in one place, right? So a lot of our schools were thinking the way they had to tackle this problem was to go out and kind of do asset mapping. How many people have done asset mapping, right? Yeah, okay, some people are right. But, they felt like what they needed to do was go out and do this big scan of all the nonprofits in their community, all the services, and create a map or a list. And then every time someone came with a problem, they would pull that out. And they, but really, all they were doing is creating a big research project for themselves every time they had to solve a problem. And 80% of the problem was about four very straightforward issues. And we quickly realized that actually this wasn't um, a services disconnect, it was a design-based problem, and it had to do with the way that we were talking about connecting families to services. So just imagine family A comes into a school, mom is talking to the parent outreach coordinator, and the parent outreach coordinator says, your family's hungry, I really need to get you connected to SNAP. 
mom has a conversation later with uh, the community school director, and that community school director says, you guys are really, you know, kind of living marginally. I need to get you connected to home base so you don't enter the shelter system. And then later they're talking to a vice principal, and that person says, wow, you know, I really have to get your child enrolled in Child Health Plus. They're not getting insurance coverage they need to get. Well, that parent now feels like they have to enter three different bureaucratic processes. And they've heard this different messages from everybody. So imagine instead if each one of those three folks says, wow, I see you're struggling with this issue. I have to get you connected to the local single stop office. It's just down the street. Not only does that reinforce the um, legitimacy of single stop as an intervention, but it looks just a whole lot simpler for a family member, right? They don't have to try and take this on. They're going to get help all the way through the process. So um, in partnership with Public Policy Lab and with Single Stop, we actually went out and started um, doing the work of understanding what were those barriers, what were those breakdowns that were happening in those conversations between families and schools, and coming up with a proof of concept, which we tested this past spring, of looking at improving communications, uh, looking at creating some simple um, templated materials that schools could use to hand out, doing translated materials, writing some short scripts, hanging up posters, and testing those different design interventions. Um, in doing so, we discovered that we actually saw a 17% increase in intakes. And mind you, that 17% increase in intakes happened during May. All right, so imagine what's going on in schools at the end of May. It is chaos. Everybody is running around trying to get to the end of the school year. Not a lot of attention, but even these really simple, what I called fast, cheap, and out of control solutions started to generate responses from families that needed access to benefits. So we're poised now to look at how we expand that. And I won't go into the, we'll come back to the conversation about scaling. Okay. Yeah. So great, so our project was, like I said before, part of the Designing for Financial Empowerment series, um, and the goal was to improve retention at the financial empowerment centers. Uh, how many folks here know what the financial empowerment centers are? That's a pretty, pretty good, pretty good. Um, but, but for those who don't, the financial empowerment centers um, are, offer free one-on-one -on -one financial counseling to any New Yorker who wants to take up the service. Uh, we have about 25 centers in all five boroughs. Um, and we want to increase our client retention at all of them. So uh, that was the, uh, the gist of this project, is that you know, all financial counseling and coaching programs tend to have issues with retention, as, and, and we're no different, but we think that we can change that, and we, that's how we got engaged with Parsons and the designers to, to innovate new ways in, in uh, increasing our client retention. So um, the financial empowerment centers are an outcome-based program, meaning that we are not just tracking like how many people we get through the door or how many counseling sessions that we do. We want to know if our clients are actually moving towards uh, more financial stability, more financial capability, right? So we track, um, you know, did they improve their uh, credit scores? Have they reduced their debt? Did they get access to safe and affordable bank accounts, right? So, you know, those meaningful metrics tell us, you know, how our clients are actually doing and it helps affect our, um, in, you know, helps us evaluate the program, right? Um, but if we're only seeing a person once, then we lose on that opportunity to collect on those further metrics, right? We need to have folks come in for multiple counseling sessions and keep them engaged in the service um, to, to be able to see how they're doing and, and, and report on, on their successes. But, um, you know, our focus is on retention, not just because we want numbers and we want to say, hey, look, these are all of the, the numbers that we can produce, but um, rather that we know that you know, sustained engagement with a financial counselor really truly is um, the most important thing that affects positive behavior change. That's great, yeah. And Marshall, we know you're not in government, but you, uh, and you've been credited, but let me add my voice to your championing of design services um, throughout the city, so thank you. Thank you. And so. From, from, so from our, our perspective, a little bit of context about how city community development works. I mean, we, we form partnerships and programs um, with leading nonprofits, municipal government agencies, in the cities that we operate um, that are focused on expanding financial inclusion and economic opportunity uh, for low and moderate income uh, households and, and, uh, and individuals. And you know, my, my, formerly my role is uh, 
communications policy and research. That's the team I work on, that's the work I do. And that gives me a kind of a vantage point uh, to see programs that we're running around the country. And one of the things I noticed when I started at started City, I've, I've been there since uh, 2013, was that the, I was seeing programs and partnerships that incorporated some element, some aspect of how service design works, you know, whether it's you know, letting the stakeholders lead the way in terms of identifying the challenge and um, highlighting potential solutions. And there were just so many opportunities I, I, I could see for um, service design to influence the work that we do and to be really transformational. And um, so I, you know, I gave it a while before I started talking about it um, uh, internally, but to their eternal credit, um, Bob and uh, Eileen understood the value of service design and its significance no matter how poorly I, I attempted to describe it. And so in every conversation that we had, we got a little bit further, we started identifying needs, and when we started having conversation with, and I know we're not supposed to uh, pick favorite partners uh, either, but um, I have to say among my favorite partners <laughs> is the City of New York and the, and the Office of Financial Empowerment and, and the Office of Economic Opportunity. And the, uh, the, the chance came up, the uh, challenge came up with um, the Office of Financial Empowerment within the Department of Consumer Affairs to take on, as, um, uh, as Bob described earlier, um, the challenge of free tax preparation services and the earned income tax credit. Um, it was some, a, a program that offered low income residents um, free tax preparation services so that they could take advantage of an important tax credit. Um, but only 3% of those who were eligible were using it. Um, 77, I think, percent at the time were paying anywhere from $150 to even in some cases $300, $400 for tax preparation services. And they were missing out on all these other benefits in the meanwhile. So it, it was a perfectly formed question, um, a perfectly formed challenge. It, was, it had results that were in many ways measurable. Um, and so we, we gathered together these partners, um, the Desi Slav, um, Mayor's Office of Economic Opportunity and uh, Office of Financial Empowerment to start designing financial empowerment with the goal of studying and understanding why are so many people paying to use a service that they can get for free. And it gave us the opportunity to, to work the way that I think at City we really like to work, which is to, to use these partnerships as a way of unlocking our partners' ability to experiment with new techniques and approaches and methods. Uh, to learn new things, to, to run a pilot that then could, if successful, be expanded to two more programs, including the one, the third one for financial empowerment centers just, that just mentioned. Um, and then with the, with the eventual goal of replicating it and expanding it to other cities. And the program, the, the, that first pilot, yielded more than 60 different new service concepts that could be applied at various different stages of a, a person's journey through using free tax preparation um, from awareness to afterwards. And we've worked with the city to support the rollout of several of those new service concepts. And, but the, the beyond just sort of the, the linear connection between the goal we set out to achieve and the new service prototypes, there was all this other learning that took place and all these sort of unintended effects that took place. We learned a lot about how people perceive free services or the, the tax preparation services and how, the, uh, how there was a big information gap between what people thought they knew about those things and their awareness of it and even down to the marketing and the branding and the logo. And like something simple that you would think we would, you know, we would at some point realize and capture. I mean, you know, Bob earlier mentioned that we talk about the EITC by its tax code name. Well, the name of this, the official name of this free tax prep services is the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program, which Vita, it sounds, you know, it sounds like an energy drink. It doesn't, you don't know what it is. And so when you, when you, when you turn around and say, why don't we just call it uh, NYC Free Tax Prep? And, you know, you are able to sort of unleash these, some of them very simple changes to how a service is produced or communicated, but some of them are very complex and attacking complexity is not only at the heart of our, of, I think, everybody's work here, um, but it's also something that I think service design is, is really well suited to take on. 
Um, and so we've been sharing these learnings with our other partners around the country, with other cities and municipalities, and we really look forward to continuing to do that. And I have to say, this is really a dream come true um, for, for me personally, but also for, for the service design community, I think, at large, and for many of the people that we've worked with who, who are, feel like they're being listened to and they feel like they are part of a process that is bringing New Yorkers into designing services for themselves, which is really, I think, a, a wonderful achievement. Thanks, Laura. I also don't work for government, so uh, right. I'm going to give uh, my perspective. And uh, I wanted to highlight, and I agree with Marshall, this is a dream come true. So this is where I com I'm coming from in this moment. Um, so I wanted to highlight a project uh, that, we, that I got involved that is part of this uh, umbrella projects uh, designed for financial empowerment on which students from the transdisciplinary program, some of them are here in this room. <laughs> Shout out to them. And, uh, uh, and uh, the project uh, uh, was in integrating citizenship and financial empowerment in New York City. Uh, as Bob uh, uh, talked about it uh, early on, and focused on how immigration and financial empowerment are intertwined aspects in the lives of many New Yorkers, right? Immigration being such a central issue in our, in our city. And what are the barriers, especially for low-income populations? So I guess uh, what I wanted to mention, and I think there are some images uh, now in the background about, uh, about that ex uh, showing that experience, it was, we spent some time, uh, our students, you know, in partnership with uh, uh, Office for Financial Department, also uh, Mayor's Office for Immigrant Affairs. Uh, our students work in close relationship with them. Uh, it was quite a learning journey. Um, and one of the things that we spent a lot of time, uh, you know, trying to understand was to uh, understand these two journeys, the journeys of immigration and naturalization and the journey of uh, you know, the financial goals a family uh, might have, and really try to map those out and understand what are the moments where you can connect the dots and, and see where, where were the opportunities for creating new connections. So I guess it was a very quintessential, I suppose, uh, a service design exercise of trying to understand journeys and see, trying to understand how people are feeling and, and, and what are the different mindsets at those different stages that allowed for, for the integration between these two moments. Um, so we, uh, uh, you know, in the end, we, the work consisted of a, we are bound because that was part of a course inside of the school here, so we are bound to the 15 weeks kind of a, a limitation of the semester, but it was wonderful because the results of the, uh, uh, of the outcomes of the students' projects uh, were uh, taken further into uh, pilot implement implementation and further development, and students also got involved as interns uh, helping uh, teams develop that, uh, the project on, and uh, the, the outcome was then, uh, uh, you know, helping uh, it was part of a, the delivery system, also involved in libraries, uh, library, public library systems in the city. So it was quite an exercise also in trying to um, connect the different parts of the infrastructure, the, infra, the different infrastructures related to the uh, uh, public sector, both in the immigrants' uh, fair side, the financial uh, empowerment side, and the, and the delivery of the service in the public library systems. So that's my service design story. Yeah, no, it's terrific. And you are highlighting so many of the pieces of finding these unexpected nuggets or connections between systems. Um, Jess, do you wanna just share a little bit from the internal perspective in government, what happens when these unexpected uh, opportunities are found? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, so I think one of the biggest unexpected takeaway things for me was that uh, you know, we're thinking about client retention, and like we tend to just focus on getting people through the door and then hope that retention is just kind of an afterthought or we just assume that people are gonna come, wanna come back once they've experienced our wonderful services, right? Um, but what came out of this project is that client retention really shouldn't be an afterthought, but rather it should be baked into the services at the earliest possible moment. Um, so, you know, this would help better our, prepare our clients before they engage in the service. So the theme of two of the prototypes that came out of this particular uh, version of DFE, the wayfinding videos and the 
uh, client journey map, which you can see on the Designing for, for Financial Empowerment website, dfe.nyc, shameless plug. Um, but the theme of those two prototypes was around um, talking about the results or the activities of working with a counselor, the, or what's gonna happen within the confines of a financial counseling session, rather than just the, you know, the outcomes or, or the results that, that you're gonna get. So we, instead of saying, you know, we can help you reduce your debt, we might say something along the lines of, your financial counselor is gonna come sit with you, they're gonna help you open up your bills, and then they're gonna call these debt collectors with you to help you negotiate your debt, right? Um, so those are two very different ways of, of marketing or talking about your service. And so in the discovery phase, we heard a lot of clients saying things like, you know, I knew I, need, I, knew I needed to do something about my situation, but I just, I was scared to come to the appointment, so, because I just didn't know what to expect, right? Um, and so we think that if we can, you know, expose some of those processes and be more transparent on the outset, that will be, people will be more comfortable coming to us and, and get a better sense of what the service actually is. That's great, thanks. And Mike, you had mentioned scale, and sometimes we think about design as only happening at the, you know, the prototype phase. Um, but the aim, of course, is to transform how systems work broadly. Do you wanna talk about how you're approaching that at community schools? Yeah, so one of the nice things about working in, in such a large initiative, community schools right now has grown to 227 schools. We're working with about 117,000 students. Um, and I looked it up. Actually, the community schools initiative in New York City at that size, if it were its own school district, would be the 23rd largest district in the country out of 13,000 school districts. So whatever we're designing in community schools in and of itself, even within that encapsulated environment, has big implications for scale. So what we learned from five schools this past spring and what we extend to 25 schools this upcoming fall can be rolled out to 10 times that number this upcoming winter. Um, so all within that environment, and that's exciting. But um, what's interesting to me is that uh, we want to see this intervention evolve across all 1,700 schools in New York City because every school in the city is dealing with students that live in high poverty. That's just a fact. Um, I think the poverty rate on average in New York City schools is around 67%, so it's a very high number. Um, but frankly, what we're designing, it's not rocket science. It really is kind of that bottom of the pyramid intervention that helps communicate to families about how to access benefits. And the tools that we're designing um, should be usable, we believe, by NYCHA, by HRA, by settlement houses. So we, we want to take the design-based intervention that we're creating for a school environment but use those aspects that speak to how families navigate the system more effectively and share those with other partners who are dealing with those same families in their work anyway and begin to help our users, our consumers, see the system not as fragmented but as unified. That's great. Um, Tina, we also, we've made the point, and can't be said enough, that all of this work is about outcomes and results and getting better, but the process does matter. Um, and uh, can you speak a little bit to how the process as you experienced was different or um, sort of what your takeaways, particularly around issues like building consensus and trust that are not necessarily lifted up as like, these are the goals while we're planning this project. Um, yeah, um, we can tell when people were skeptical about us saying we're going to be thinking about how to help them develop a new database system, case management system. Um, and I think the some of the tactics that um, civic service design mentioned are you know things like talking to people one on one, talking in groups, uh, seeing the service in action, and I think part of the process of gaining consensus and trust was using those tools and showing the various providers we were working with that we were investing our time. We weren't just asking them for their time and their energy. Oh, tell us this. Give us your feedback. Blah blah blah. But like, we're gonna go out to you. We're gonna be as flexible and adaptable to your time as we can be. We're gonna try to talk to as many people on your staff that matter. You tell us who those might be. Um, we'll go on ride-alongs, we'll go on site visits, you know, we'll have open, open office hours, phone calls, case, con you know, all the multiple modes we can get 
so that you can reach out to us and we can hear you. Um, but that part of the process alone isn't enough for building trust because you can listen and you cannot do anything. Um, so the other aspect of just making sure we were in constant communication, making sure that we were showing incrementally with the prototyping that the feedback they were giving to us was being processed. We were asking more follow-up questions. We were trying to figure out not just what one piece of feedback would tell us, but together, collectively, across like five different providers with very different systems. Um, they're not the same. They don't do things the same. They, we shouldn't expect them necessarily to do everything the same way. Um, how can we show that we're taking all of their concerns and figuring out how to bundle them together and approach them and tackle them and then communicate back to them, hey, this piece of feedback, you can see the result here in this new version that's come out. Tell us what you think about it. And you know, instead of saying, we've only got size eight shoes, everybody figure out how to cram your feet into them, you know, it's like, okay, we've got a range of things, tell us like what is working. Um, so I think that we had to, we, we, again, as a beneficiary of service design, the, the work that Ariel and her team did gained us a lot of trust that way because they already saw this happening on the ground before other, other members of our team went to them. So we had a good basis to begin with, but we had to really keep working on it and I think the constant communication, the feedback, and if some things couldn't be done, explaining why and not just letting it go. Um, so I want to ask Laura to, you, you said it's a dream come true, that's awesome. Um, but I, I wanna ask you a question and then um, lead into the sort of final question in the interest of time for panelists. But the uh, question for you is, where is this field going? Where has it been recently? How have you seen it evolve? Um, and where do you see it going? And then just for the other panelists, as sort of your last, I give you options, you can leave the audience with some takeaway that was most important for you or some piece of advice to colleagues in city government, to students, um, to others uh, in the audience um, after Lara gives us the overview. The overview. Well, I've, I've, I have been indeed studying and uh, somehow being part of the service design community. And, uh, you know, for quite some time, I think service designers were trying to prove their value. And, and while I, was still, I still think that's the case, I think we're now in a new stage where, you know, things like this are happening because the value has been somehow, somehow already proving through uh, great projects that have been uh, done out there. That said, I think one of the things that I'm most excited about and, and the, the recent evolution of service design is uh, the spread of um, in-house service design teams, whether within government, which is very much the case of, uh, you know, of, uh, uh, of today's event, but also within uh, you know, all kinds of organizations and the public sector in general, but industries such as healthcare, uh, education, financial services, technology. So I think uh, there is there's something very interesting when that happens because you know one of the great advantages I think of having an in-house team and people working from within it, it allows you to go deeper and establish longer engagements across different parts of a large organization, but also frees you somehow from the typical client designer relationship, and it creates. A, you know, a different stage for collaboration from within that I think is really beneficial in terms of the, you know, angles of improving services, improving people's lives in the end. So I think uh, I, I'm very, uh, you know, I'm very excited about this, this, uh, this new developments, and I think it really takes uh, service design uh, value beyond uh, somebody mentioned early legacy process, right? You're able to really, you know, operate in a way that you can transform organizations from within. That it's that's really different and and um, and uh, and incredibly exciting. And so it's bringing user centeredness, bringing empathy, bringing uh, active listening and empathy and all that we're talking about, and you know, making uh, uh, the process of delivering services, you know, go beyond reengineering and bringing these things such as, you know, I, Bob used the word dignity before, and I really want to capture this in the process of service design because uh, I think when you start work, when you work from within, I think you have the ability to understand people, but also understand the people who are delivering 
believer in the service who have a legacy and you know uh, and um, a certain organizational culture they they bring and all, all the tests and knowledge they've accumulated over the years so overall I see this development as uh, and you know uh, I guess New York, New York City civic uh, service design uh, uh, studio is uh, is a great example and I'm very excited about it so Tina let's go down to you and come all the way back and end piece of advice or big takeaway? Uh, I think that uh, the, the skills needed to do um, service design are, on the one hand, things that people are familiar with, um, partly because they're common sense, um, and partly because they are kind of embedded within some of the ways we normally do things, like getting feedback. But on the other hand, the I think the fact that you can be more conscious of like what these things are called, that they're part of an overall framework, makes you more conscientious that you will actually follow through on the principles. And the, I think the point of talking about this as not just user-centered design, but human-centered design, really takes us back to like, how is this gonna work? It's gotta work for humans. It's gotta work for humans, all of us involved in it, and for the impact and the effect and the outcome that we wanna get at the end. Yeah, I, I think Tina's really right. Uh, I, I told this story when we were thinking about this panel. I had been working with New York State on implementing uh, lean strategies on basically every way that they interact with consumers around licensing and um, uh, certifications. There are thousands of these processes across the state. And at one point, um, my colleague and I sat down with the chief innovation officer at New York State who was fresh out of the private sector and recently in government. And he's very excited and telling us, you know, we really want to get out there and start using decentralized app-based solutions. We need to get iPads out into the hands of our field workers, and we need to really create effective structural backend. And we're like, that sounds exciting, but could you just help us convert every paper form into a fillable PDF? <laughs> And he kind of looked at us for a second and said, so we're really going to use these decentralized strategies and get iPads out into the hands of our field workers? So overcoming that disconnect, I think it really is important to embed yourself in the process that you're trying to address. And for those of you who are young folks who are entering this field, I, I really highly recommend that you start by looking for a role in government or in the nonprofit sector. Just get right in there. Work there for a couple of years. So you really see what drives people's decision making, what that culture is made up of. It'll deeply inform your process to create effective interventions. Um, so yeah, just to kind of grow on that, there's a couple of things that I wanted to say. Um, you know, it, the, the, you know, service designers and government bureaucrats. You seem like unlikely bedfellows, right? And so um, I actually came onto this project um, transitioning from uh, managing the financial empowerment centers on the nonprofit side to my role in city government. So my brain was kind of in two spaces at the time um, as we were rolling out with this project. Uh, but it was, it was a fantastic experience. But um, I guess my ad advice to uh, you know, other civil servants who are, who are interested in, in this design is to definitely keep your yes and hat on. Like sometimes in government, we tend to be like, put up barriers and say, no, that'll never work. And that'll never work. Like just let it go, be creative. Like let the designers sweep you away with your creativity, but you're gonna wanna help guide them towards implementable solutions at the end of the day. But you also don't wanna lose that, you know, joie de vivre and that creativity, but make sure that you document it. You know, everything that, all of those stickies that come out at like the wide, ang wide angle of the, uh, of the diamond, like take pictures of those, uh, put them in a Trello board, do what you have to do, because a lot of things aren't gonna be fe feasible or realistic, you know, by the end of the, of the prototype, but there's gonna be kernels and elements in those ideas that you're gonna wanna come back to, possibly within the scope of the project or possibly down the road. So that's what we did with this particular iteration for uh, DFE is we created a Trello board and we're able to, um, you know, reference it and export it into a CSV file and share it with, with stakeholders. And I can tell you, you know, we have new ideas for new projects and we are all go, already going back and, and referencing that and, and pulling little bits and pieces out of it. If this wasn't possible now, we didn't have the bandwidth, but like, wouldn't it be cool if we could take this concept and run with it next year? And so, so definitely keep a record of everything. And then the other thing I would just say as a takeaway, um, you know, if you're thinking about working with service design, 
um, just me being in my field for 15 years or so, um, I keep thinking back to that client who said, you know, I was too, you know, apprehensive. I was too scared to come to the appointment because I didn't, I didn't know what was going to happen. Like I've probably heard hundreds, if not thousands, of clients say that to me over the years. Like, for, like it's such a common thing for, for people to say, but it just never would have dawned on me to reverse engineer our retention and our marketing strategies in, in the way that we did. So for me, I found that very, very powerful. So I, mean, I couldn't agree with that notion enough. And, and honestly, I feel like um, for me, the, the thing that um, I come away thinking about with this is that I think it's incredibly important that the work of the studio is focused on low and moderate income New Yorkers and their challenges and their challenges with the services that they use. Um, you know, when we first started working with um, Parsons, uh, Eduardo, and, and Lara's teams here on designing for financial empowerment, one of the, they were they weren't just a partner in this. They were also they were also mentors in understanding service design and understanding how uh, how the process should work and how what how what it should look like. And one of the first things I learned from them was that we we wanted we we designed for the extremes, knowing that most people are in the middle. And starting with working with people who are financially vulnerable, living on low incomes. Um, the, the needs of that population from a service perspective, they are often so often underserved um, and, and punished for being, for being poor in many ways. You know, the, the, the way services are, are provided, and not, by, not, not necessarily by intent at all, but simply just by the constraints that many people who are financially vulnerable are living under. And so a process like this that's truly collaborative, that seeks to not just ask questions of, of people and then walk away and design it in a closed room, a solution for them, as Bob said earlier, designing at people instead of instead of with them, but truly bringing them along for every part of the process. The people on the front lines of of delivering a service who see things every day, like you said, and hear things every day, um, but aren't asked and don't necessarily perceive them in front of them actively. But when sitting in in front of or in a room with working alongside the people who they're delivering services to, and with the policymakers who are helping develop those services. Um, gives you all these enormous opportunities to visualize the problem and the solution in a completely new way. And so the focus in this case of this work here on the needs of low-income New Yorkers, I think, is it's not just good for the, the, the linear the projects and the outcomes of the projects that, we're, that, that they're going to be working on, but it's also good for government. It's good for p policymakers to see and to be a part of, and it's also good for the public. Um, yeah, I would say that that's basically what I take away from this. Yeah, final words. Uh, I think uh, thinking about public uh, servants, uh, there's one thing really democratic, I think, about service design, as Dina said earlier. It's because part of it is really common sense and how to uh, um, understand from the people directly involved. Um, so I would say that people should feel that they, uh, if you're not a designer by training, you should you also have the right to design. You also design, and you should also feel you could you could use these tools. Um, and for the for designers, I think I want to repeat. Uh, you know, restate what I said early. You know, active, empathic, listen, uh, listening, um, and uh, uh, be compassionate and understand how where people are coming from. Understand the reasons and and people as you know as as human beings. Uh, be uh, uh, also. Uh, a steward and uh, of processes, you have to stage the design situation. You have to bring people together. That's the job of designers in, in this field, in my view. And uh, last but not least, and echoing with what uh, Jess mentioned, is you have to have ideas. You have to be creative. You have to bring people to where they weren't thinking before. That's your job to do uh, as well. And and visualize, make it material, tangible, and show people anticipate the futures. That that's the job of a ultimate job of a designer, in my view, too. You guys have been fantastic. This has been a wonderful panel. So please join me in thanking them and let me bring up Ariel to close us out. Thank you so much, you guys. So I want to thank you all for being here today with us. Um, it's been amazing to have a full room of our design friends in-house. I would love to thank Parsons, who's been such a gracious collaborator in this event um, and hosting us in this beautiful and design-rich auditorium. 
I would like to thank our founding partner, City Community Development, for their generous support. As you saw today, they are truly visionary um, and working alongside us in creating this service for New York City. I would also like to thank our partners at the Mayor's Fund to advance New York City. We truly could not do this without them. Um, I work alongside them every day as well, so thank you. And Last but not least, I would like to thank our team at the New York City um, Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunity. If I can ask you guys to stand up, it's a really big group that's helped put this incredible event on. You only saw a few of us on stage, but please give them a round of a hand. I can't think of a better team to work on every single day, so thank you. And thank you all again for coming out today to visit us. Check out the toolkits on your way out, grab some postcards, and visit us online at nyc.gov slash service design. Thank you.